Tonight, football shocker at Penn State. Former defensive coordinator Jerry Sandusky is charged with sexual abuse of underage boys. Dean Reynolds will have the latest. Will Mississippi vote to ban abortion with no exceptions? Randall Pinkston reports on Tuesday's ballot measure that would define human life as beginning at conception. Women warriors, home from the front lines and battling addiction. I thought I was going to die. We'll visit the first facility devoted to helping them turn their lives around. And Japanese couples untying the knot. Lucy Crabb shows us how marriages are shattering from the stress of this year's earthquake and tsunami. This is the CBS Evening News with Russ Mitchell. And good evening. We begin tonight with a disturbing story involving a college football powerhouse. A former longtime assistant coach for the Penn State Nittany Lions is out on bail tonight after being charged with multiple counts of sexual abuse of underage boys. Also, two more Penn State officials are expected to turn themselves in amid charges of a cover-up. Dean Reynolds has the story. Jerry Sandusky, the defensive coordinator. For 67-year-old Jerry Sandusky, a jubilant career at Penn State has dwindled to a perp walk and prosecution. Jerry's very, very depressed. He's very upset. He's very distraught about the charges, the allegations. In a 40-count indictment ending a three-year inquiry, Sandusky is alleged to have targeted at least eight boys for sexual advances or assaults over 15 years. Pennsylvania Attorney General Linda Kelly said this case is about a sexual predator who used his position within the university and community to repeatedly prey on young boys. For 32 years, Sandusky was a top assistant to Penn State's legendary head football coach, Joe Paterno, before retiring in 1999. In 1977, he also founded the Second Mile, an organization for troubled children. Trying to motivate them to mentor them. Sandusky denies the allegations. Lee McCauley, a former Second Mile Until counselor, is among his now, associates expressing it. shock. So there's nothing that I've ever seen that would lead me to believe that he would do anything of this nature. The grand jury said Sandusky's organization gave him access to hundreds of boys, many of whom were vulnerable due to their social situations. One said he was assaulted at least 20 times at Sandusky's home and the boys' high school in 2005 or 6. In another case, a Penn State graduate team assistant allegedly witnessed a 2002 rape by Sandusky involving a 10-year-old boy in a shower at Penn State's football facility. The assistant told Coach Paterno about it, and Paterno is said to have told athletic director Tim Curley and university official Gary Schultz. But the grand jury found neither man acted on the information and even downplayed it in testimony. Curley and Schultz have been charged with perjury and failing to inform proper authorities. They're expected to turn themselves in on Monday. Both deny any wrongdoing. And as for Joe Paterno, late today he released a statement saying he is shocked and deeply saddened that anyone he thought he knew may have harmed young people. Russ. Dean Reynolds, thank you very much. The debate over a controversial pipeline that would carry crude oil from Canada to refineries in Texas got even hotter today. Protesters marched around the White House demanding President Obama step up to stop it. Here's Whit Johnson. In their biggest demonstration yet, we don't want no fucking trouble. more than a thousand protesters had tough words for a president they helped elect. If he were to approve the pipeline, would you vote for him in 2012? The answer to that is, you know what? I might not. They want President Obama to kill the Keystone oil pipeline, which would run 1,700 miles underground from western Canada across six states down to refineries in the Gulf of Mexico. TransCanada CEO Russ Gerling says the project would create 20,000 jobs and that the protests have come as a surprise. We never expect it to be uh, the lightning rod for um, the development of the Canadian oil sands. Um, at the end of the day, we build a conduit from a to B. Union leader David Molino of Labor's International calls it a no-brainer. This pipeline is, a, a, is not just a pipeline, it's a lifeline for many of our members. But the Canadian crude is mixed with sand. It's hard to extract, having to be dug or steamed out of the ground, a process that pumps greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. 
Environmentalists like Susan Casey Lefkowitz say it's the dirtiest oil on the planet. What the major oil companies are doing now is they're going after the more destructive, more expensive, more risky forms of oil. Politically, it's a tough spot for the president, pitting major labor unions against environmentalists, two groups that will be an important part of his reelection bid. Although the president is under pressure to create jobs, environmentalists say the Keystone Pipeline is not the way to do it, even heckling him during a recent speech in Denver. Thank you, guys. We're, we're looking at it right now. All right, no decision's been made, and I know your deep concern about it. President Obama's final decision was expected by the end of the year, but that deadline is not concrete. And given the weight of the issue, don't be surprised if it's delayed. Russ? Whit Johnson at the White House. Thanks. Turning next to campaign 2012, Republican candidate Herman Cain has declared once again that he will not answer any more questions about allegations of sexual harassment. Following a one-on-one -on -one debate with Newt Gingrich in Texas last night, Cain cut off reporters who tried to press him on the charges. Mr. Cain, the attorney for one of the uh, women who filed a sexual harassment complaint against you. Don't even go there. No, no can, I, can I ask my question? No. And for more perspective on the Cain controversy, we are joined in Washington by political analyst John Dickerson. John, good evening. Good evening, Russ. Herman Cain says, I'm not answering any more questions. Let me ask you, will it be that easy for him? Is this story going away? Mr. Cain said the story's over, but that doesn't make it so. The press will continue reporting it, and his rivals, who've been staying away from these past sexual harassment settlements, have, begin, have begun to turn up the pressure a bit. Rivals say that Cain must come out and talk about these issues because Republicans have to have a candidate who's been thoroughly vetted to avoid surprises during a general election matchup that might threaten their chance to beat Barack Obama. Okay, let's talk about the president. Election day is one year from today. November 6, 2012 is on a Tuesday. How optimistic is the White House these days? Well, the president faces a very grim landscape. Unemployment is at 9 percent. His approval ratings are five points below the 50 percent mark, which is needed for survival. And three quarters of the country says America is headed in the wrong direction. But the Obama campaign is working hard. 2,000 organizing events nationwide today, an effort this week to reach out to 8 million younger voters who couldn't vote last time. But the organization the president really needs is the Republican Party. The sooner Republicans give the president an opponent, the sooner his team can start attacking that person, turning this election from a referendum on the president's performance to a choice between two alternatives. John Dickerson in Washington, as always. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Russ. And a reminder now that CBS News will broadcast the next Republican presidential debate. It will be live from Spartanburg, South Carolina, next Saturday, November 12th, at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific time. The latest battle over abortion rights comes to a head on Tuesday when Mississippi voters will consider an amendment to their state constitution that would say a human being is a person from the moment of conception. Randall Pinkston has more. With religious conviction, Les Riley led the petition drive to put personhood on the Mississippi ballot, declaring that a fertilized egg is a person. You're exactly the same person that you were then. Only thing that's been added to you is time and food. Riley, a father of ten children from Tupelo, says the constitutional amendment is intended to outlaw all abortions, with no exceptions for incest or rape. We don't have the death penalty in Mississippi for rape. Why would we punish the rapist child? That position offends Kristen Hemmons. People on the S side keep saying to me, you know, well, don't punish the baby. Punish the rapist, you know. Um, but what they leave out of that equation is me. Hemmons, now married with three children, was raped at gunpoint 20 years ago on her college campus. If this had been in place and I had gotten pregnant, I wouldn't have had any options. Um, I would have been forced by the state government to bear a child, which might have killed me physically, if not emotionally. Mississippi's personhood amendment is part of a national movement to restrict a woman's ability to obtain a legal abortion. Similar efforts are underway in at least nine other states, including Florida, California, and Ohio, to put the issue on the ballot next year. I helped open up the first abortion clinic here in the state. Dr. Beverly McMillan performed abortions for only three years. I lost my stomach for it. She strongly believes life begins at conception. It is not ethical to kill a human being because they are inconvenient or unwanted or what we consider burdensome to us. It's going to put physicians in a position of criminal uh, liability. 
potentially. Infertility specialist Dr. Randall Hines and many other Mississippi physicians say personhood would bring too much government intrusion, and they say it's flawed science. Only about 20% of fertilized eggs actually go on to become children. So to provide legal rights to all fertilized eggs really is not consistent with what we know about the world. In Tuesday's statewide election, both candidates for governor, Republican and Democrat, say they support personhood. Already, the decades-old anti-abortion campaign here has been successful. There's only one clinic left in the state that provides legal abortions. Randall Pinkston, CBS News, Jackson, Mississippi. Coming up on tonight's CBS Evening News, where the jobs are, why this American construction manager is looking for work overseas. A major development in Greece tonight, where Prime Minister George Papandreou has agreed to step down. Greece is under pressure to form a new government in order to get its next installment of European bailout funds and avoid defaults by mid-December. Back in this country, the latest government job numbers showed a slight dip in the unemployment rate in October as the economy gained some 80,000 jobs, but nearly a third of America's unemployed have been out of work for a year or more. Some have decided to go global in their job search, and Tony Gaida met one of them. You built all of this. Right. Building things is in Kevin O'Neill's DNA, Lincoln Center, and other iconic buildings in New York. And this horse farm, an American dream for his wife and three kids in rural New Jersey. But there's no demand for O'Neill's skills these days. Do well, you ever imagine you'd have to leave your country to provide sustenance for yourself and your family? Never. Never in my wildest dreams. This is Chester. He Across 30 years, O'Neill made his name as a top construction manager in New York. But the financial crisis shut everything down. O'Neill couldn't get a nibble. Then in 2008, a call from halfway around the world, the Middle Eastern Emirate of Dubai. So how did they find you? Um, the recruiter was given a mandate to find one of the most difficult, ornery son of a bitches in New York that got things done. He yeah, jumped at the like chance. Guns. I was very reluctant until I saw the job. And to me, it was like building the pyramids again. For a year and a half, he oversaw the construction of artificial islands and revolving apartment towers until the credit crisis hit Dubai. End of project. When I went to Dubai, I, I said, okay, you know, I'm do this for a short period. If, it, if the job doesn't pan out, I can always come back home and then things will get better and I'll go back to work. When I came home, things were worse. Recruiter David Cohn Gorham says men like O'Neill must be ready to move abroad. Since the beginning of the recession, we've seen an increase uh, of about five-fold in construction professionals looking to move out of, outside of the country for a job. I'm frustrated, I'm upset, but you still gotta, you gotta, you gotta make a living. So I do what I have to do. I hate it. I hate not being in America. The destination? Yes. Heathrow. This week, O'Neill left America for England, where he's interviewing for a job. The job is 10,000 miles away from home in Australia. Tony Guida, CBS News, Flanders, New Jersey. Next up, returning female war veterans finding help for their addictions at a program all their own. Three bombs exploded today in a crowded market in Baghdad killing at least eight people and injuring almost 20 more. The bombs went off as shoppers bought food and delicacies for a major Muslim feast this week. President Obama, of course, has pledged to bring American forces home from Iraq by the end of the year. But with Veterans Day coming up this Friday, many returning service members are discovering that their problems are only just beginning. And that's tonight's Sunday Cover, a new program for helping one group of vets cope with the stresses of coming home. I thought I was going to die. I wanted to die. Tara Lewis served in the U.S. military for 13 years, three of them in Iraq. But her biggest battle came when she returned home. And I rushed myself back into life, back into taking over the house. When you say you rushed, you, you, what do you mean exactly? Like I just threw down my gear and just started running. Being a mom again. Mm-hmm. And I didn't take any time for myself. I didn't realize that. Not being able to sleep all night was not a normal thing. It was an emotional mess. Lewis started drinking so much that she couldn't look after her three kids. Eventually, the authorities took them away. What did you do at that point? I went to Central Park. 
I walked around for hours. Um, I found a spot by the water and I took like 30 Ambien and I attempted to kill myself. Lewis eventually sought help at the Samaritan Village Women Veterans Program. Nestled in New York's Catskill Mountains, it's the first program of its kind dedicated to helping female vets suffering from substance abuse and trauma. Women need to have a place where they feel emotionally safe to be able to process the kinds of traumas that they have had. They don't necessarily feel comfortable doing that in an all-male or mostly male facility. The all-female facility opened this year. Former Army Reservist Jessica Allen says the program saved her. This is one of the happiest times of my life right now. Hmm. It wasn't always so. Barely out of high school, Allen was deployed as a military prison guard in Iraq. We had a lot of grenades and mortars coming into our camp every day. What did that do to you as a person? It made me very fearful, afraid for my life, actually. I wasn't sure if I was going to return home. Traumatized, she turned to drink and drugs when she came home to cope with her post-traumatic stress disorder. She sold drugs and ended up in prison for three months. It was there she decided to seek help and come to Samaritan Village. This is a place where I could be understood without any judgment. Tara Lewis is scheduled to leave Samaritan Village in two months. She's in the process of getting her kids back and looks forward to starting over. What have you learned about yourself here? I learned that I can be that person I used to be. I can be Tara again. More than 200,000 women have served in the current wars in Afghanistan and Iraq during the past 10 years. Among the women veterans of those wars, nearly 20% have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. We'll be back. A magnitude 5.6 earthquake centered northeast of Oklahoma City shook up the state and several of its neighbors late yesterday. It was the largest in state history. The quake buckled highways and cracked some buildings, but caused no serious damage or injuries. At least 10 weaker aftershocks were reported today. In Japan, that powerful earthquake and tsunami last March have triggered two very different reactions. One recent survey shows a third of women and a quarter of men are more eager to marry because of the disaster. Another survey shows 15% of men and women are thinking something else. Lucy Kraft has more. Suddenly, the wedding aisles are jammed across Japan. The March 11th tragedy has sparked a newfound desire to say, I do, among many younger Japanese who have been struck with matrimony fever. This couple says, we lost a lot in the disaster, but our family bonds have never been stronger. The official statistics about a marriage boom aren't out yet, but the wedding industry says their sales are up by as much as 20 percent. Meanwhile, matchmaking agencies say they've been inundated with singles anxious to get to the altar. But as some exchange rings, divorce is also a smash hit. For exes like Susumu and Ayako Inagaki, the March 11th disaster not only didn't bring them closer together, coping with hardship pushed them further apart. At this so-called divorce ceremony, husbands and wives take part in a strange and somber ritual to nullify their nuptials. Anecdotal evidence says Japanese couples are calling it quits in record numbers. I thought to myself, he probably isn't the guy I should spend the rest of my life with, she says. By late spring, the couple said they realized their four-year-old union was a mistake. The disaster gave us an opportunity to rethink our relationship, the husband says. For divorce planner Hiroki Terai, business is booming since the tragedy of last spring. He says some people start to think you only live once. Others suddenly realize they don't share the same values. So while the earthquake triggered a yen for romance, it has also cracked open the weakest of marriages, sending couples going their own separate ways. Lucy Kraft, CBS News, Tokyo. And that is the CBS Evening News. Later on CBS, 60 Minutes, and a tribute to Andy Rooney, who died Friday night of complications from surgery at the age of 92. Thanks for joining us this Sunday evening. I'm Russ Mitchell at the CBS Broadcast Center in New York. Scott Pelley will be here tomorrow. Good night.